During the Second World War, an Australian naval vessel managed to send one last desperate message to the outside world before ship and crew disappeared forever. A terrifying message of only two words. Flying Dutchman. This is the end of the world, the mythical boundary between East and West, the southernmost tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. Hundreds of years ago, when the first European explorers ventured through uncharted seas towards strange new worlds, this desolate cape saw the birth of the most famous of all maritime legends. In the shadow of Table Mountain grew the myth of the Flying Dutchman, the phantom ship which is cursed to sail the seven seas forever to bring doom and disaster. An apparition come to haunt sailors and pursue them with blood-red sails billowing in the wind. A legend like that stems from the hope and despair of people. It is full of warning, which we may not even fully fathom as yet. Bartholomew Diaz, Vasco da Gama, and all those Dutchmen which followed, and the Flying Dutchman. A magical place such as this was just bound to give rise to a legend, and it became the legend of the Flying Dutchman. That legend tells me you always have to be wary of the sea, that you cannot challenge the sea, that you can't challenge the gods here at sea. If anyone is well qualified to search with us for the Flying Dutchman, it's Willem Voss, builder of the Batavia, replica of a famous Dutch East Indiaman which celebrated triumphs both in Holland and Australia. A friendly shooting match near Sydney with another famous replica, Captain Cook's Endeavour. but no ship is as renowned or as infamous as the Flying Dutchman. But all taken into account, was there a Flying Dutchman? What kind of ship was it? And who was the captain? And where did it all happen? Here at the Cape? Table Mountain. Beyond it, the Cape of Good Hope on its peninsula. A strange, desolate part of the world, more exposed to the winds and whims of nature than anywhere else. A warm current collides here with a cold current coming from Antarctica. Warm layers of air mingle with cold. And because of the cold water and the colder air in the lower layers and the warmer air in the upper layers, those sort of conditions are perfect for what we call um, a refraction. And we get a phenomenon which we call um, a mirage or a superior mirage. And in the case of the Flying Dutchman, I would imagine that the refraction was of such a nature that um, what you've actually seen is your own vessel following around the horizon. So it looks like a, a sort of shadow of your own vessel. So it's all an illusion, a mirage, reflections in the air. That didn't stop the legend from conquering the world as a game, a computer program, an Olympic sailing class, even a cocktail. The legend was told and retold by cartoonists like Karl Barks at Disney or Hergé, the man behind Tintin. The Flying Dutchman's romantic tale of love and suffering made it especially suitable for Hollywood. And the composer Richard Wagner turned it into a famous dramatic opera. There's a delightful story involving the Flying Dutchman at Cape Horn. A ship encounters the shadowy Flying Dutchman. The crew is filled with fear and tells the captain, we must fly or we'll founder. But the captain says no, takes a megaphone and shouts, a few miles from here there's a ship laden with Dutch Geneva. Go there. And there you should have seen the Flying Dutchman and the speed he suddenly made. And that's how we escaped from a horrible death this time again. Is it all then just little more than a good idea for a cartoon book? A funny anecdote? A nice yarn? No more? There are those who think differently, even eyewitnesses. 
it was a Saturday morning and I opened the window to look out at the bay and between the station there and the lighthouse was this old sailing ship. Now I couldn't say that it had seaweed dripping from the rigging but it, it looked kind of that old. It looked like something as if you'd taken it from the bottom of the sea and plonked it there. As we ran at Cape Point, this ship came out of the mist and it was actually steering a parallel course with us probably for about a few minutes, at least for about five minutes, maybe about more. About four or five minutes. It virtually floated on top of the water rather than went in the water. It was silent, you couldn't hear any engines or any, any motivation. When we approached it, it turned in 90 degrees and went into the mist bank. It was like opening a curtain and closing a curtain, and we saw this distinctive back transom of a boat. That's when it disappeared in the mist. We never saw it again, obviously. But aren't we much too civilised and intelligent to believe in phantom ships? With our satellite communications, scientific knowledge and hyper-modern GPS systems, in our world today, there's no room for flying Dutchmen, is there? Well... Phantom ships are of all ages, and from all directions on the compass, from Europe to Japan, from Australia to America. And phantom ships still exist today. Now they're ships which take in cargo under false documents, and then take off with it, never to appear again. Then there are gangs of criminals behind it, or even worse, pirates. Pirates are not something of the past. Some 500 ships still fall prey to pirates every year, notably in Southeast Asia. Strange things still happen at sea. The sea is about the only thing on Earth untamed, its paths untrodden by tourist crowds. And if strange things still happen there, then let's have another and more serious look at the legend of the Flying Dutchman. For the origins of the Flying Dutchman, we have to go back to the times of the great discoveries, to the Portuguese, and maybe even further back, to the myths of antiquity. The Flying Dutchman uh, is based on a very old, ancient legend. It is a phantom ship that is passing by the Cape, once known as the Cape of Storms and it is based on the legend of Adamaster. Can you imagine that people thought that those mountains there were cast down here by gods? In Greek mythology, there's the tale that before mankind, the earth was inhabited by gods and giants, and they fought an enormous battle. In Greek temples, you can still see that depicted on beautiful frescoes. The myths tell us how the Titans tried to overthrow the Olympian gods, the Titans fought a bloody battle, but they lost. One of the vanquished was the Titan Adamasta. He was severely punished. Adamasta was flung to the furthest known corner of the world, and that was the Cape. And that's where he sits. Some say that he became the entire Table Mountain, and others say he's locked somewhere inside it. By the end of the Middle Ages, Portugal turns over the first page of the legend. In 1488, Bartolomeu Dias set foot on land here as the first European to arrive. And he called it Cabo Tormentoso, Cape of Storms, a name well chosen. When, ten years after Dias, Vasco da Gama reached the Cape, something disastrous happened. Adamasta, the ancient titan, was awakened. This was recorded in a book, Os Luisiades, written by Portugal's greatest poet, Camões. It says, Robust and vigorous in the air appeared he, enormous and of stature very tall, the visage grim and with squalid beard, the eyes hollow and the gestures all threatening and bad. one reads the histories uh, of their expeditions, uh, it's quite amazing with how many ships they set out and how many ships actually reached India. So one had to find an explanation for that. And it is very true that a large number of these ships were lost at the Cape of Good Hope. 
Both Diaz and Da Gama paid the toll. Da Gama died far from his native country in India, and Diaz fell prey to Adamasta, the Phantom of the Cape. This is probably where Camões uh, and his words came true. I speak to ye the words of warning and of doom, namely storm, don't come too close to me, that Diaz actually drowned and he lies buried somewhere here in the Cape. It's not yet the ship or the captain on the ship, but when you look how this specter is described, then you can see there are certain features that you then see later reflected in the description of the Flying Dutchman. The Book of the Flying Dutchman truly opened with the arrival of the Dutch, who came to outdo the Portuguese one century later. Before other competitors such as the English, they settled at the Cape with the building of a fortress. This fortress later became the nucleus of Cape Town and was their key to the riches of the East. You see, the fortress lay right along the beach, and wouldn't it have been but for the Dutch if they wouldn't have added a few miles of land here where now all those buildings are? And if you know that the Dutch passed by the Cape with more than two million people at the time, and over a million of them did not return, one million people. And they were not only Dutch, they came from all over Northern Europe, Northern Germany, Scandinavia, Finland, Possession of the Cape gave them a head start in the hunt for the mythical riches of the East. Dan Slay, author and South Africa's main archivist. The East was, was a magic place, remember? That's, that's, where the, that's where the sun comes up. That is where the wise men came from. That is where all the, the treasure was, the, all the, the uh, diamonds and the rubies and the emeralds that were in the crowns and the coronets of the kings and the princes on the crowned heads of Europe. They didn't come from Europe, they came from the East. A halfway post, the Cape became the symbolic boundary between Europe and the riches of the East, a dangerous boundary. And that turns the spotlight on another factor which helped shape the legend, life at sea itself. Visiting Willem Foss and his Batavia is another specialist of the seas, Peter Branches captain of an equally remarkable historical replica, the Clipper Stutt Amsterdam. And the smells that add into it, you know? The fragrance of wood, you smell the ship. And when you're sailing laden with spices, that adds into it too, cinnamon or something or other, a totally different odor. Or people get seasick and there's a sour smell of vomit, you know? Look, here we're standing nice and comfy, but one deck below it would have been much lower and you would have had to have crawled all over and everything, packed tight. We tend to think of it romantic and all that, but it wasn't. It was tough for the men here, and you bet there were lots of them stacked up in here. In some cases, the people were at sea for more than a year without touching land. Uh, discipline often brutal, the food bad, sickness rife, uh, no companionship of the women, for instance. They didn't have much fun. Only images of a more recent age, when sailing was already so much safer, may give some idea of how hard life at sea used to be. The success that the sailor had at sea often depended on the kindness of the creator. We had things like lifeboats and life belts. Most of us could swim. <laughs> Very few of them could swim. You were fortunate if you survived. If you're at sea for so long, deprived of everything, you've got nothing but that ship with all those people in it and so on. And you can't get off all this time to let your thoughts wander off everywhere. Well, what happens in those heads, you simply cannot say, you know? Strange thoughts come up. Well, you often know that too. It's not just the hardships. People often think it's the storms and all that, but the real hardships often come when there's no wind, when you're just floating about. 
That's when the madness strikes. That's when you're at the mercy of powers no one can control. That's when people are cracking up. It's not for nothing that they're called the doldrums, where you find yourself then. No, it's true that you have to make a difference between mental and physical hardship. Look, if there's no food for a number of days, you face physical hardship, which leads to death in the end. But mental hardship takes much longer. There may still be food around, there may still be barrels full of peas and beans. But in fact, you're cracking up, your mind is just giving in. A journey round Africa to the east. Conditions on board were hard for the sailors. And add to that the fear of mysterious diseases and dangers or of what lurked under the dark, unknown waters of the oceans. If I were an 18th century sailor on a ship in the middle of the ocean, I would see the sea as a very vast and threatening place, a kingdom of its own. I would probably believe that strange creatures lived in it, creatures that could harm me. I would probably believe that not only were there monsters and whales and other giant things in the sea, I would know that the sea was my potential death. I would know that only the side of the ship stood between me and death by drowning. I probably wouldn't be able to swim and I probably would think it would be better not to be able to swim because I would, be, I would only prolong the danger that I was in and the pain that I suffered. The sea is peopled with all sorts of supernatural beings. There are mermaids and sirens and sea dragons and ships, goblins, uh, that has always provided a fascination for the sea. The unusual occurred, and the unexpected, and the unexplained occurred. And perhaps that, that is the material that ghost stories are made of. Giant sea snakes, monsters of the deep, creatures that would kill a man without hesitation, and, of course, ghost ships were all said to explain the strange phenomena on the voyage to the magical east. Tales told and retold in bars and taverns of harbours such as Cape Town. Ever more blood-curdling stories about a ship and a captain doomed to sail the seas for eternity. And so the legend became increasingly real. It was the English who were responsible for giving the phantom ship an identity. It was not just any ghost ship. It was a Dutch vessel. The English were madly jealous of us, of course. Look, later on they made a mess of it, of course, with the apartheid and all. But the Cape was a strategic position of prime importance, a key to a new world. But also a source of rivalry, which made the English add the next building blocks in the shaping of the legend. I think the idea of the Flying Dutchman is moulded by a deep-seated hostility which the English felt towards the Dutch in the 17th century. That rivalry had its reasons. The amazing emergence of Holland from the Middle Ages. An insignificant backwater in the mightiest empire of the time, Holland battled for and gained its independence from Spain in a religious war lasting 80 years. 80 years of war which steeled it into an ambitious trading nation whose citizens swarmed across the world, weapons at the ready if necessary. Holland's brief golden age which perplexed Europe. In the course of the 17th century, the Dutch had some 10,000 ships, half of everything that sailed the seas. Their flag flew everywhere. Their ships dominated trade and accumulated amazing amounts of wealth and power within two to three generations. What mugs, eh? They thought they could take on the whole world with a little bit of land of theirs. In the catacombs of the National Archives in The Hague lies the document which marks the amazing emergence of Holland. This is the official treaty of the Peace of Munster with the seal of the Spanish King Philip IV. After this, Holland expanded everywhere. We traveled and traded throughout the world. But we met with new resistance, the English. Three naval wars fought within 20 years defined the image the English would shape of the Dutch. One year stands out, 1666. 1666, the year of the beast. 
the 17th century was a deeply superstitious age. Most people believed in witchcraft. People were deeply superstitious. For a long time, there were misgivings about what was going to happen. The fact that there had been blazing stars in the sky that year, the fact that there was a, a solar eclipse in June. Everybody knew something bad was going to happen. But in England, up to that point, everyone thought something bad was going to happen to the Dutch. We got it wrong. England had, had a bad run of luck, you could say, in that we had um, a plague which devastated the southern part of England and was still killing people by the hundreds in 1666. In the summer of 1666, the English had landed at Vesterschelling, um, burned 150 Dutch merchant ships and then set fire to the town. The leader of the raid was a man called Sir Robert Holmes, and Sir Robert Holmes's bonfire was celebrated all over England. And lo and behold, two weeks later, on Saturday the 1st of September 1666, the English and Dutch fleets engaged off the French coast. But just as they came together, a huge storm blew them apart again. That storm travelled up the south coast of England, and on Saturday night, it reached London. In the early hours of Sunday morning, it blew thatch off roofs, it toppled chimneys, and that moment, a small fire broke out in a baker's shop here on Pudding Lane. Within 24 hours, the fire had swept across the city. Part of London today stands the monument, in remembrance of a disaster which wiped out 90% of England's capital, everything which is now the city of London. In five days and nights, all of this was destroyed in the greatest fire England had ever seen. As the, the wind blew embers and flakes of flame, people started to say, it's not an accident, it's a terrorist attack, it's the Dutch. It was a Dutch baker, a Dutch rogue, people were writing. Pity us, pray for us, the Dutch are firing our city. Within 24 hours, Dutch were being beaten upon the streets. They were being chased from their homes. Their houses were being leveled to the ground. It was as if it was as if it was 9/11 in 1666, as if Bin Laden had burned London. And then, lo and behold, the Dutch sail up the Medway and capture or burn a significant number of our, of our naval vessels. The, the English flagship, the Royal Charles, was, was towed away, and that took the heart out of the English. We thought that now that was the time to make peace. Is that still in the English history books? The, 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 the firing of the Medway a, appears in a footnote to the English, hist in the English history, I think. It's something that we'd rather forget indeed. Rivalry further shaped the legend, and when in the following century Holland sank into relative insignificance, Flying Dutchman became a way for the English to express not fear, but scorn. It was intended to express, those were once mighty merchants, now they're just fleeting shadows that sail across the seas there. And logically, therefore, it was the English who provided the ship with a captain, too. From Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine, emerges a van der Decken who is mentioned as the Flying Dutchman. But he has a new motive, namely the motive that willy-nilly he insists on sailing around the Cape, but is refrained from it by storms, then swears and says, I, even when God forbids it, I will achieve it. Man might have immortal life and wander over all the oceans of the world. Let him sail to the edge of doomsday. From then on, the legend speaks of a Captain van der Decken who is doomed by a curse to sail around the Cape of Good Hope forever. Was it true then? Would I sail alone till doomsday, longing for death, with death denied me? And from this moment on, the legend ceases to be just a tall tale in taverns or the ship's hold, but becomes an inspiration for artists. 
a favorite subject for authors, composers, and poets. The soul has been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely it was that God himself scarce seemed there to be. The demon figure begged the girl and while the doomed spectators know, robbing her of neck and woe. And the boys and the beacons extinguished the light as the boat of the stone of death came in sight. I bowed it from pillar to pillar each form as it shrouded like a plague flying loose to the storm. But what mainly inspired us with this horror and astonishment was that she bore up under a press of sail in the very teeth of that supernatural sea and of that ungovernable hurricane. You see, a ship like this carries you along, and I'd almost say, as with the Flying Dutchman, even without anybody on board, such a ship carries you along carries your thoughts along, carries the legend, carries the story along. For that story stands, of course. And that, I think, is the reason why, as you well know, of course, that when a sailor perishes at sea, his soul transforms into an albatross, floating across the seas forever. You've seen them, albatrosses, so beautiful. All they do is glide through the sky, float and float. And that's the souls of all those sailors, just floating on and on. Throughout the ages, throughout the ages and if such a being floats beside you and looks at you for that's what they do they just remain beside you you're six seven feet away and he just looks at you there's a person looking at you call it superstition but that's the way it is moby dick with captain ahab willing to sacrifice his ship and crew in his hunt for the white whale the book voices the fascination with the sea and the supernatural, where the captain, just like the Flying Dutchman, can challenge heaven. What is it? St. Almost fire! Jesus Christ in heaven, what's he doing? Oh, he knows what he's doing. In the 19th century, people loved reading about the macabre and tales of horror. Those were the days when all sorts of phantoms and horrors just flew from the heads of people onto paper. Take this one. And people saw in the old Jewish legend of rabbis who, just like God, created life out of clay, a golem, which totally went out of hand afterwards. Another of such ghost stories. The Flying Dutchman fits into a literary genre which starts to enrapture readers. Ghost and horror stories which all have one thing in common, man exceeding God's bounds, challenging the heavens. A figure such as this one, Faust seduced by Mephistopheles, the devil, in his quest for the secret of eternal life. Faust was a man who asked questions others didn't dare ask. Questions which usually are answered by the church. Questions on life, death, and matter. How can you breathe life into it? Subjects which were taboo for common people in those days. Knittlingen, southern Germany. Next to the church. The house where Faust was born. This medicine chest belonged to Dr. Faust and was found here about a hundred years ago. Inside it, he kept all sorts of alchemist things and medical fluids or poisons. So Dr. Faust really existed? The devil came to get him. Here in Malbron Monastery, he studied in this tower now all wrapped in plastic pending restoration. That's us again. So here's the chimney through which the devil hauled Faust to hell. Ah. Yes, and this was his study. So he truly existed? Oh yes, Faust was born here in the neighborhood and really studied here in Mulbrun, in this room here. And this is where he went to hell. Well, you either believe it or you don't. 
If Faust really existed, what about a figure like the Flying Dutchman? Did he also exist as well? In his book, Phantom Ship, the author Frederick Marriott gives the captain a place of birth. The Zeeland harbor of Ternosen in the south of Holland. Van der Decken and the legend of the Flying Dutchman are carefully nurtured here. Every now and then, one of the inhabitants plays Flying Dutchman in a local bar, where they also serve Flying Dutchman beer. According to Marriott, Captain van der Decken had left Amsterdam and stopped in his native Ternosen before setting out to the east. He'd been locked up in here for days already by a storm which prevented him from sailing. They always come from the west, so in those days there was no way of leaving port. So he says to his wife, Tomorrow we sail. But Willem, tomorrow is Easter Sunday, and the storm is not lying down. What do I care about that storm? But van der Decken. That's the day of the resurrection of Christ. No sailor has ever dared sail on that day. God damn! Tomorrow I sail. If not with God, then with the devil. And on that Easter morning, van der Decken sailed, with the heavens darkening in anger and his ship's sails billowing in the wind. Appalled, his wife and neighbors thought they could discern the devil standing there beside him. On the basis of Marriott's story, the proud citizens of Tenozen now even point to the house where the Flying Dutchman was born. Now it's a lively Greek restaurant, but in Marriott's days, officers were quartered in here and the house was said to be haunted. That is, the story goes that there was quite a row in here at night. Well, that's what you get if a bunch of soldiers get bored in here. And could Tenozen have been the home port of a proud East Indiaman? The tiny harbour had room for a few fishing smacks and was so small it could be locked with a heavy pole every evening. Now it has been filled in and transformed into the old market of the little town. Well, I hardly think it possible for an East Indian man to have ever sailed from here. 120 feet long, 25 feet wide, it wouldn't have had a place to turn here. The story that Tenusen is the birthplace of the Flying Dutchman stems without doubt from the 19th, if not the 20th century. And it's a typical example of a historization process. The story of some unnamed sailor who must wander on throughout eternity is then localized, becomes specified and identified with a specific place. Washington Irving, where the Flying Dutchman comes up the Hudson River. Um, Half a German also places him in the Indian Ocean, Heine in Scotland, and Wagner, of course, in Norway. The fact that the Flying Dutchman can be seen in any location and by lots of different people then enhances the idea that uh, he's sailing the seven seas, he's always there, the ship never sinks. That is as it may be. But in fact, there's only one place that matters. This is where it happened. That Ternosian star story, that's just kid stuff. This is where it happened, Cape of Good Hope. The Portuguese even call it Cape Torment. For two months, they try to go around the Cape. More than nine weeks, storm upon storm. The crew begged the captain to turn back. The mate swore upon the Bible. Captain, please turn back. But the captain grabbed the mate by his throat and threw him overboard. And the Bible went overboard after him. And then above the storm, a voice boomed out of heaven, turn back. But the captain took his pistol and emptied it into the clouds. If it isn't with God's help, then with the devils!
and 19th century authors added to the legend, especially German author Heinrich Heine with his book From the Memoirs of Mr. Schnabelowski. In that story, the Flying Dutchman comes ashore every seven years where he may seek a woman who will not only remain faithful to him, but is even prepared to die to save him. The moral of Heine's tale is that women should never have themselves seduced by a sailor, let alone a Flying Dutchman, and that men, in fact, are done in by women. In fact, Hen is rather amused by the whole story. He thinks he'll never succeed in finding such a woman anyway. And so the poor flying Dutchman is rowing ashore every seven years, only to be turned down and return to his ship with his tail between his legs and sail on for another seven years. There's punishment for you. The theme of the flying Dutchman only really takes wings with composer Richard Wagner writing his favorite opera, The Flying Dutchman, in 1841. Where Heiner pulls your leg, Wagner takes the Flying Dutchman's romantic quest for a faithful partner deadly serious. Had Richard Wagner not written his opera, then the story of the Flying Dutchman would probably not have spread around the world as much as we know it today. Nicht so weit verbreitet, wie man sie heute kennt. Wagner brings in an extra romantic theme. In the end, the Flying Dutchman does find a faithful woman, Senta, who is prepared to die for him. She vows eternal love and throws herself into the sea, and at that moment, the ship will sink uh, and no longer sail the oceans. Pity he loves her so much that he'd rather sail the seven seas right until Judgment Day and see her die. But since this is an opera by Wagner, she decides to die for him anyway. Well, if his loving center is supposed to have died for him, the Flying Dutchman no longer needs to sail the seven seas anymore, surely? Uh, we're talking about a legend, a legend of the Flying Dutchman. Now all set aside, all the rumors and embellishment, what really remains? Was there really a Flying Dutchman and when did it sail? There's nothing in the archives. No mention of a Van der Decken or a Flying Dutchman. But is there some ship or sailor who stands out? Some mysterious event? Well, there is. Uh, about 20 years ago, when I first uh, started uh, researching, I found a sequence of events in a period of three months, all shocking, all almost unbelievable, and all of them uh, to the minds of the people of the time who were gullible, uneducated, and very superstitious, uh, would have impressed them tremendously. We have to go back to Cape Town, around the end of 1689 and the start of 1690, when the Dutch settlers were alarmed by some terrifying omens. First, a comet appeared. Always a bringer of very bad uh, messages. I think the, the, the message of the comet the was that the return fleet of that year would founder. On the two. Yeah, yeah, founder soon. And that is what happened? Did it happen, yeah. The loss of the return fleet was not only a disaster for the Cape, but for all of Holland. And in the days that followed, a mysterious disease brought wholesale death and destruction to the slaves and the indigenous people. And the next thing, the day before Christmas, a monster was born. A lamb with one head, two bodies, uh, four tails, you know, a, a, a creature of the devil. And that wasn't all. Ships appeared inside the bay, only to disappear mysteriously and without trace. Sunday, January the 29th. We cannot express our amazement that the galliot, which was seen by all and everybody last night, is not anywhere to be seen today, which ranges strange forebodings amongst us all.
The vergulde Vlaming is believed to be the galliot which was observed the 28th of January at the mouth of the bay. Friday the same. Skies were overcast in the morning and when it cleared all expected to see the ship observed before, but it had vanished. The name of the ship, Vergulde Vlaming, when you say it quickly, and you say Vergulde Vlaming, Vliegende Vlaming, the sounds are not dissimilar. And I think in the telling of the story in English, the name was translated from Vliegende Vlaming into Flying Fleming, but th that sounds ridiculous. And I think it became Flying Dutchman instead. Mysterious ships, captains who seem to come from nowhere and vanish just as quickly, the mystery of the ship Snooper and its captain, Focus. The skipper of the Snooper was one Albert Focus, son of Barend Focus, a captain both famous and notorious. The Snooper with father Barend Focus sailed to the east several times in an almost incredibly short time, twice as fast almost as other ships would. And 15 years later, his son did exactly the same. And that fits, because it all happened two months later. Yeah, but here's another snooper. Yeah, and there must have been two snoopers then. That's odd. Mysterious ships, amazing achievements of captains who throughout the years emerge and vanish just as suddenly, it filled the Cape with strange forebodings. The Cape was uh, known as the Tavern of the Seas, the halfway station between Europe and the East. It was a melting pot of Eastern fear and European um, uh, superstition. That became the story of the Flying Dutchman. But tavern talk alone doesn't keep a legend alive. Also in later centuries, sources mention strange observations. The ship Leven, for instance, met the Flying Dutchman near Africa in 1823. And indeed, when we consult the logbook of the Leifen, it does state twice, saw a strange sail on the lee side of the ship. And what about the most famous sighting of the Flying Dutchman? Every book mentions it. That time when the future King George V of England and his brother Edward sailed aboard HMS Inconstant and met the Flying Dutchman. A future King of England, an eyewitness, George V and his brother write in their memoirs, 11th of July, 1881. At four o'clock this morning, the Flying Dutchman appeared in a strange red aura over the bow. Thirteen people in all saw her. The man who spotted her first fell from the yard to his death this morning. But is it true? The ship's logbook indeed mentions someone falling from the yard and being buried at sea on the same day, but there's no mention of a Flying Dutchman. And from the personal logbook of Prince Edward, one can deduce he wasn't awake that morning until 6.30. So is the most famous sighting of the Flying Dutchman possibly just princely bragging and no more? During World War II, German Admiral Dönitz writes that several of his U-boat crews reported seeing the Phantom ship. But over and over again, he seems to return to the Cape. In 1939, dozens of beachcombers see him heading straight towards the shore. Half a century later, it happens all over again. It reached the point where we are now in line with the lighthouse. It looked like something as if you'd taken it from the bottom of the sea and plonked it there. This ship came out of the mist and it steered a parallel course with us, probably for about... A few minutes, at least about five minutes, maybe about more. About four or five minutes. It virtually floated on top of the water rather than went in the water. But what do people see who sail daily around the Cape? The fishermen here. There is word of a flying Dutchman sailing around the Cape. That's all, but I've never seen it. We must see it before we believe it. But that doesn't mean there's nothing going on around the Cape. To sail around the point is one of the most dangerous things you can do. No one can predict the sea. The sea rises and lies down in its own time. That's nature. I'm still afraid. I never say you shouldn't be afraid. You must fear the water. And there's good reason to be afraid. The Cape of Good Hope is one of the world's greatest ship cemeteries. 
More than 5,000 ships, from old galleons to modern tankers, foundered along this coast, often with all hands. Silent witnesses to these disasters linger everywhere, under and above the waterline. This is the meeting point of two currents, the Agulhas current coming down the east coast and the Benguela current flowing down the west coast. One bringing in the warm waters, starting at 38 degrees near the equator, and then having more or less a head-on collision with the cold Benguela current, which originates in the Antarctic, which scientists say literally sends the fish on the homeward bound journey because they cannot survive in a colder uh, ocean current. You find that the swell is also very confused. You don't have a consistent swell coming from one direction only. To go from absolute calm to absolute maya in a couple of hours, in a matter of hours. The weather around the Cape, often so beautiful, can suddenly turn on you with demonic strength. This is an example of um, a series of storms coming towards Cape Town, one after the other. The first one is coming out of the southwest. Then an, you see there's another small one forming, and uh, now it's getting strong very quickly. Yes. Suddenly, over a 12-hour period, you suddenly have this powerful small storm just coming out of nowhere and hitting Cape Town there. There you see the storms moving away, yes. and a new one coming behind it very quickly. A um, massive uh, storm like this where the energy inside the storm is so huge you don't know the sheer extreme of the power inside. They say that this is uh, like three atom bombs going off every five or ten minutes. When you're inside, it's the perfect storm. You can see how the legend of the Flying Dutchman was born. Absolutely. Yeah? Yes, you can see always there was storm and always bad weather. Yes. Um, if you look at the South Pole and the, the Earth from the bottom, there's continual ocean below South Africa, below South America, and below Australia. Yes. So these storms go around and around. Yes. Always. Always. Never ending. Never like, ending. Like the Flying Dutchman. Yes. It makes sense to me. Some people, even the mystic people, will say that um, the storms are the same. They're the same storms. Yes. They don't change. They just go round and round and round. Forever. Forever. It just never ends. Storm car. Storm car. The coastline stretching some hundreds of miles north of the Cape bears a sinister name, Skeleton Coast. It's the Skeleton Coast because of the carcasses of uh, ships yes. and maybe sailors too. Look, this is the Cape of Good Hope, also called Cape of Storms. Along this little bit of coast, some 20 miles long, hundreds of ships were lost. Here, for example, June 1722, eight ships, May 1737, nine ships, and here, July 1822, 11 ships, that happened some years before Wagner wrote his opera, The Flying Dutchman. They must have heard of this in Europe, for this was quite a disaster. And here, to cap it all, May 1865, 22 ships in a few days' time, and hundreds of people were drowned in this. I think the secret of the Flying Dutchman is that man must respect nature. We are not in control. We are not supermen. Our technology and knowledge hasn't extended to the very boundaries of the sea. We haven't conquered the sea. It's as simple as that. On an ocean, everything becomes puny. Even the largest ship, 500 meters long, whatever height or breadth, is being back to being a nutshell in a storm. Under normal circumstances, you do not place yourself above God. But that's what the Flying Dutchman did. That's what the Flying Dutchman did, and the story teaches us that in the end he was dearly punished for it. So, uh, there's the madness for you. Madness.